today we'll be taking a look at a fairly underrepresented fighter aircraft from the Second World War. Not one of these sleek low-wing fighters representing the major powers, but rather an older, reliable machine primarily seen in the wars over the smaller European nations' skies. We are of course talking about the Polish-designed PZL P-24, which would be the last of a long, rich lineage of Polish-designed fighter aircraft. The story of this aircraft goes back to the PZL P-11, a slightly earlier design first flown in 1931 that had been developed as the main fighter for the Polish Air Force. Under the direction of Polish aeronautical engineer Zygmunt Palowski, the P-11 represented the culmination of a project to move Poland away from the imported wood and fabric aircraft of other European nations towards a new generation of domestic, all-metal monoplanes. The P-11 became an immediate success, and one that gained much international attention. When it first entered service, it was one of the most advanced fighter aircraft in the world, instantly recognisable by its distinctive gull wing, something that had become somewhat of a hallmark for the so-called P-fighters up to this point. As the P-11, and its predecessors, the P-7 and P-1, began to steal the show at various aircraft exhibitions across Europe, it was realised that the design could have real potential in the ever-growing export market. After observing the new designs emerging in Britain, France, Germany, and the United States, many of which were also all-metal monoplanes, PZL felt confident that this was indeed a sound move. Development of this export model, soon to be designated as the PZL-24, began in early 1932, but two major hurdles prevented the project from proceeding at a rapid pace. The first problem was finance. Poland was unable to put forward the large amounts of capital required to fund the production of large-scale export orders. Further compounding this problem was the desire of potential export customers to pay both by instalments and also to pay in goods rather than exchangeable currencies. The second problem, and ultimately the more immediate of the two, as various financial aids eventually came into play, was that of the power plant. The P-11 was powered by a license-built version of the Bristol Mercury, and a stipulation in their 10-year contract with Mercury was that Poland could not export any of their license-built engines. A new engine had to be sourced, and after the equivalent of some 1930s window shopping, a supercharged version of the Gnome Rhone Mistral Major was selected. This engine, a twin-row 14-cylinder radial, had only begun production in 1939, and had plenty of room left in its development life. It was considerably larger than the Bristol Mercury, and this necessitated a redesign of the P-24's nose, but it did provide a significant upgrade in power. The P-11's engine produced between 525 to 640 horsepower, depending on the engine model, whereas the P-24 would start at 720 horsepower. With the new engine selected, PZL submitted their design for approval in February of 1932, and they were quickly authorised to proceed. That being said, production of the first prototype did not begin proper until the end of the year, as the engine was delivered more than three months late, and without the promised all-metal three-blade propeller, which was something of a necessity if the aircraft wanted to go anywhere. Not wishing to deal with further delays, it was decided to install a wooden two-blade propeller as a stopgap so that the flight trials could at least be completed. The prototype was then equipped with the new engine and temporary air screw in May of 1933, and it completed its first flight at that same month. The flight was almost a complete success, but it ended rather abruptly when the propeller hub decided to disintegrate, taking the wooden air screw with it. Fortunately, test pilot Captain Boleslaw Olinsky, and I hope I pronounced that right, was able to bring the prototype down for an emergency landing. Unfortunately, the damage resulting from this meant that the entire front half of the aircraft's fuselage had to be rebuilt. Following repair work at the PZL facility in Warsaw, the prototype took to the skies again in October, this time with the originally intended propeller installed. In late 1933, it completed a series of flight tests, highlighting the need for some 150 modifications, all of which were subsequently introduced on the P-24-2, 
the second prototype, which also came to be known as the Super P24. The changes made included the installation of a new Naka-style cowling, the redesign of the weapon mounting structures, reinforcement of the parasol mounts, and various revisions to the cooling and exhaust systems. The changes resulted in a net improvement, and this aircraft, assembled in early 1934, went on to establish a new speed record for its class in June, achieving a top speed of 414 kilometers an hour. The third prototype, also constructed in 1934, was the first to be fully armed, outfitted with a powerful armament of twin 20mm cannons and two Browning machine guns. The airframe was now in a configuration that would remain mostly unchanged throughout its production life. In general, the aircraft was fairly small, at just 7.5 metres in length, with a wingspan and height of 10.72 and 2.69 metres respectively. This allowed it to be relatively lightweight, with an empty weight of just 1300 kilograms and a maximum takeoff weight of 2000 kilograms. The third prototype was flown for the first time in August 1934, after which it was demonstrated to the Polish Air Force and various foreign delegations who were interested in purchasing export models. It then went on to be displayed at the 1934 Paris Air Show, where, with its powerful armament and an advertised top speed of 416 km an hour, it was considered the best armed and fastest fighter aircraft in the world at the time. Unsurprisingly, this helped PZL's hopeful export model to become an actual export model. One of the first customers was Turkey. The Turkish government negotiated a contract for license production in 1936 and imported 66 P-24s plus the parts to assemble another 20 more. The order consisted of 40 P-24A aircraft fitted with cannon and machine guns, plus a smaller number of the P-24Cs which featured a quad machine gun armament instead. Bulgaria ordered 14 examples to begin delivery from 1938, followed by 50 aircraft of the C and F variants. The latter was the most capable of the batch, introducing a 970 horsepower Gnomerone 14N07 whilst retaining the mixed cannon and machine gun armament. This version also introduced some aerodynamic improvements, whilst also adding an armoured windshield to the cockpit, with two further armoured plates protecting the pilot from behind as well. In the winter of 1934 to 1935, the aircraft would also be evaluated in Warsaw by Romanian officials, who also expressed interest in the type and ordered six P-24Es a custom variation designed to Romanian specifications, which was powered by a license-built Gnome Rhone 14K. Following this, Romanian aircraft company IAR would then pick up production of the P-24E, license producing 40 more of their own, before deciding in 1939 that the P-24 was apparently no longer adequate. This reportedly led to IAR developing an experimental low-wing modification of the aircraft, which would eventually bear fruit as the famous IAR-80. Further modifications to the design were explored by PZL as late as 1939, with a planned K variant carrying four 20mm cannons, and an L variant being fitted out as a fighter bomber for close air support. Concurrently, the Polish Air Force had actually avoided purchasing any P-24s for themselves, opting to wait instead for the projected P-50 fighter. Unfortunately, this turned out to be a mistake. By the time it became clear that Poland desperately needed a fighter that was newer than the now ancient P-11, and the P-50 wasn't going to be ready in time, it was too late for PZL to produce P-24s in any large numbers and Poland ended up falling before squadrons could even take delivery. In total, just 184 P-24s would be built, with the majority going to Turkey, Romania, and Bulgaria. That being said, the country in which the P-24 would really make its mark would be Greece, where it served with the Eleniki Vasiliki Aeroporia, or the Royal Hellenic Air Force. Delivered through 1937 to 1938, 30 P-24Fs and 6 P-24Gs would be taken on by the 21st, the 22nd, and the 23rd fighter squadrons, stationed at Trikala, 
Thessaloniki and Larissa respectively. Of the two versions flown in Greece, the G variant was basically identical to the F in all aspects, except for the armament, it having a quad machine gun layout instead of the two cannons and two machine guns. Operated alongside smaller numbers of Blosch MB-151s, Gloucester Gladiators, and Avia B-534s, the P-24 was to be the flagship fighter aircraft for the Greeks, the only country which would actually field the Polish fighter in such a role, rather than as a reserve aircraft. With the Italian invasion in October of 1940, the P-24 was immediately thrust into frontline combat against the famed CR-42 Falco, a formidable aircraft in the early days of the war that was both faster and more manoeuvrable than its Greek counterparts. It was, however, outgunned, for the heavy armament of the P-24 was a serious threat to the small and lightly built biplanes, as well as the Italian bombers, which began a concerted offensive almost immediately following the Italian declaration of war. Hellenic P-24s, though outnumbered significantly in all engagements, would see a fair level of success for the following six months in which Greece was under attack from the Axis forces. A number of Greeks would earn their ace title in the P-24, most notably Marinos Mitralexis, who achieved legendary status in Greece for his acts of bravery during the war. Mitralexis was stationed with the 22nd Fighter Group in Thessaloniki on November 2nd, 1940, when the squadron was scrambled to intercept an incoming Italian bomber raid. The Italians, fielding 15 Cant Z-1007 bombers, were protected with a number of CR-42 fighter escorts in close support of the formation. In the ensuing interception, three of the Italian bombers were shot down, but the remaining 12, having reached their target, began the journey back to their airfield in Albania. Mitralexis, having already shot down one of the bombers in the dogfight, found himself completely out of ammunition, but decided against turning back with the rest of his squadron. Instead, he pulled up close behind the tail of one of the Italian bombers, and proceeded to push the throttle as wide open as possible. The P-24 smashed into the rear of the bomber, totally destroying the tail assembly and forcing the crew to make an emergency landing about 20 kilometers north of Thessaloniki. Mitralexis himself, having destroyed his engine in the ramming attack, followed the Italian bomber down and landed in the adjacent field. He then climbed out of his wrecked plane, ran over to the four surviving Italian crewmen, and arrested them at gunpoint with his service pistol. For this act, Mitralexis was promoted and awarded Greece's highest award for bravery, the Gold Cross of Valor, and he was in fact the only pilot to achieve such a distinction during the war. As the war progressed, attrition rates eventually caught up with the limited number of P-24s in service, and by the time of the German invasion five months later, virtually all of the Hellenic P-24s had been lost, about 24 of these being from combat. In total, the type achieved 64 confirmed victories, with another 24 probables. In April 1941, as the Germans began marching across the northern mountains of Greece, the Hellenic Air Force had been forced to merge the five remaining P-24s into one ragtag squadron, supported by five gladiators and the two surviving MB-151s. The aircraft had long lost their 20mm cannons in favour of two machine guns, as the Air Force was desperately short on cannon ammunition, and in the following three weeks of April, the P-24s achieved four more aerial victories, against two HS-126s, one Stuka, and one Dornier DO-17, before the final P-24s were destroyed on the ground by Luftwaffe strafing runs. To the northeast, Romania's fleet of P-24s had also seen some active service, being tasked to defend the city of Bucharest and valuable oil fields from waves of oncoming Soviet bombers at the beginning of Operation Barbarossa, the Axis invasion of the Soviet Union. During this time, Romanian pilots claimed 37 Soviet bombers destroyed, which usually travelled unescorted and thus were pretty easy prey for the heavily armed fighters. They also saw limited use as a ground attack aircraft during the early days of the invasion as well, though it was clear that the design was thoroughly obsolete by the end of 1941, and it was subsequently relegated to training duties. This would not be the end of the P-24's career though. 
Remarkably, it would last almost another 20 years in service with another operator, the Turkish Air Force. Having seen no combat, the P-24s remained serviceable in Turkey as frontline fighters, then as trainers, for a considerable time, all the way up to 1960 in fact, when the last of them were finally retired. During their service life, some of these aircraft were re-engined with Pratt & Whitney Twin Wasps, which perhaps would have given them the distinction of being the fastest P-24 versions ever flown. One of the aircraft was fortunately preserved at the Turkish Aviation Museum in Istanbul, where you can still see it today. As mentioned earlier, the P-24 was the penultimate model of a lineage of Polish fighters that were developed in the interwar period. Though often neglected in the history books, these aircraft were remarkably advanced for their time and were at the cutting edge of fighter development in many ways. Many of them also saw service long after becoming obsolete, and yet many still managed to put up a decent fight against superior opponents. Because of this, I am working on a longer video that goes into the detail of PZL fighter development a bit more, but I don't yet have a time frame for when this will actually be ready. It's not a question of translating source materials, it's more of a question of finding decent quality photographs, which honestly feels like an endless challenge for me. But that is a problem for another day. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the patrons. I hope you're all enjoying the new 3D models I'm trying to add to these videos. Um, as I get more confident with using them, they will feature a bit more prominently as and when they are needed. But they, as, as I said earlier, they won't be the dominating factor. They're just going to be a nice little cherry on top. A big thank you, of course, to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier members. And hopefully I've not missed anyone this week as the patron list has not been updating for whatever reason. Hopefully that is fixed by next weekend. But thank you all for your continued support, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.